Welcome to episode number 167 of CXO Talk. I'm Michael Krigsman, and our show today is going to be a great show. We're talking with Jay Farrow, who is the Chief Information Officer of the American Cancer Society. We're going to talk about digital transformation inside this very large nonprofit organization. And Jay, how are you today? Michael, I'm great. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, thanks so much for taking your time and joining us here today. Let's begin. Tell us briefly about the American Cancer Society. I think everybody has heard the name, but tell sure. us about what you do. Yeah, you know, the American Cancer Society is a global organization, very simply dedicated to eliminating cancer as a world health problem. We do that a lot of different ways through obviously research, which we're, I think we're known for. We're the largest non-governmental funder of cancer research in the country. Um, patient programs, prevention early detection programs, patient services, uh, advocacy, lobbying work, all kinds of things. We're in thousands of communities around the country, really around the world now. And uh, yeah, we, it's just, um, we have one simple mission and that's to eliminate pain and suffering from cancer, helping people detect it early, prevent it to begin with, once they have it, you know, uh, get it cured, and um, and uh, we'd love to put ourselves out of business, Michael. Honestly, how did you decide to take take the CIO role in in this nonprofit? Well, you know, it's funny when I first got offered the job at ACS about four years ago, um, I had a I told a good friend that I I was thinking about joining ACS as CIO and and he looked at me and said, well, are you still gonna keep your full-time job? And I, I think he thought I was gonna be a volunteer or something like that, not recognizing how big we are. But, you know, I, this is my first nonprofit. It's been a real privilege. I came from uh, AIG, a company before, you know, I mean, before that, Mariner Healthcare, and a number of big, large, um, kind of multinational or global uh, entities. But, and a lot of people may not know this, but I lost my wife, uh, Priscilla, and um, of course, I don't go very far. My wife, my beautiful wife, Priscilla, uh, to cervical cancer in 2007. So in 2012, when I had an opportunity to come here and do what I love, which is be a CIO, uh, but more importantly, do it for an organization that's dedicated to eliminating what took, uh, you know, took my wife and my, my three boys' mother. I mean, how can you say no to that? You get to cross your, pa your two passions, right? So it's a very, so it's a professional mission for you, but obviously it's also a very personal mission. It is. It's a crusade. I always tell people that I think in life you can, you can have a job, you can have a career, and you're lucky if you have one of those over a job, and the luckiest I think have a crusade, and um, I'm very honored and privileged to have a crusade. So that crusade, the American Cancer Society, one thinks about it thinks about it as as these volunteers and raising money, but as an organization, it's larger than I think most people are aware. So, give us a sense of the the size, the scope, the activities again of what the organization does. Yeah, no, I, I think it surprises everybody when they hear about how large we are. Um, we have a little over six thousand employees um, all around the country. We have two and a half to three million volunteers at any time that are our are, are lifeblood. And between donors and constituents and, you know, all the folks who have helped us, you're talking about 75 plus million customers at, at any given time. So we're very honored. You know, fundraising is not all we do, uh, clearly, but all we do uh, depends on it. So um, from an IT perspective, what does that mean? You know, we're the best of probably three different worlds, healthcare, uh, maybe a little bit of higher ed and research and uh, even uh, you know retail to a certain extent because we take millions of transactions we work in all the major platforms social mobile you know mobile uh, across all the digital landscape so um, we have all the big major challenges that any large entity does uh, but you know we just happened our product happens to be our programs our information our cures our volunteer networks etc so your product is essentially research and service because you're also one of the, you're, you're the largest 
researcher, cancer researcher outside of the federal government, as I understand That's it. Right. <clears throat> yeah, we are the largest non-governmental funder of cancer research in the country. So we've played a part in just about every major cancer breakthrough since the early 70s. We're very, very proud of that. I mean, you can track the lineage of uh, many of the, the cures and or the treatments, excuse me, today, like for instance, Herceptin and, and many others, uh, to funding that that was started at ACS, you know, that was funded by ACS. Um, we get a lot of great researchers early in their careers. We're proud to have had, I think the number is 47, 46 or 47 of our research have gone on to win the Nobel Prize. Um, so we have 47 Nobel laureates with ACS ties. I mean, you just don't see that kind of intellectual capital at a lot of places. So you are this very large distributed organization and you're also using, trying to use technology to further the mission and the activities that the, in which the organization engages. So can you shed some light on the kind of changes that the American Cancer Society is going through and the impact on technology and how you're using technology to further the, the mission of the organization. Yeah, no, absolutely. So when I joined, we were 12 independent divisions plus one corporate. So there was a huge opportunity right at the beginning to do a whole lot of improvement on the blocking and tackling of IT, right? You had 13 different independent IT companies, very common in the nonprofit space or even the for-profit space to have this federated model. And uh, we became one unified global functional based IT organization. So once you kind of stem the bleeding and kind of take advantage of some of those early economies of scale, we had a real opportunity to transform the way that, that we interact with our volunteers, the way that in we interact with our, our donors. And it's not just about taking digital technology and applying it toward old business process, because all that does is make old business processes faster. And that's not always a good thing. Sometimes it is. I mean, there's modernization but it's about rethinking the way that we interact with our constituents and our volunteers. Let me give you an example. You know, the millennials today, and again, I think they're painted with a very broad brush at times, but there are some truths. They are highly, they are very used to a highly customized experience. That's the same in a, in a non, not for profit in a fundraising or volunteering perspective. We've got to give them volunteer experiences that are tailored to them, to their time, talent, and treasure. Just as in the for-profit space, you know, you see for-profit organizations wanting an experience from Michael Krigsman. They want it you to feel special when you walk into a store or where you buy a product, and they want you to know that they know you're there and that they care about you. We want the same thing because we want donors for life. We want volunteers for life. We want people to know that we care, that we're here 24-7, 365. So all the systems that are behind that. Um, cloud-based identity and customer identity and access management, you know, a more robust CRM, mobile technology, uh, all of those things, geofencing at events, you know, that we're rolling out later this year where you can, where I know Michael shows up in an event and I can personally thank you. And, uh, you know, just some of those kind of cooler technologies are going to change the game for us. Um, but it's with the intent of attracting, retaining donors and volunteers, all for the purpose of furthering our mission, right? And, um, you know, if we can do that, I mean, it's going to be a game changer for us. So the impact, again, the impact of technology on this, how are, how do you work with other senior leaders in the organization to uh, convey to them where technology can add strategic value to yeah. the mission and, and some of the ways you were describing. <clears throat> that, that's been a journey, right? So my boss told me when I came here, my old boss, he's since retired, but when I came here, he said, JIT is a four letter word in this organization, uh, which I, I didn't want to ask him really what he meant, but uh, you know, he said, you've got your work cut out for you and that's why, that's why you're here. So it, what that really meant is it was multifaceted. One, IT was you know, not where it needed to be. It wasn't a strategic partner. Beyond that, it wasn't even an or, a good order taker. So we had to reestablish credibility. There is no way I could have walked in you know, three and a half, four years ago and said, 
let me introduce you guys to digital transformation. They would have looked at me as if I had sprouted a second head and said, let me show you the door. And uh, I would have walked out because nobody really cares about digital transformation when email and all the table stakes aren't even working properly. So I, you know, for me, I had to earn credibility. So going back to your question, one of the ways I got folks to begin to listen was to, uh, you know, a obviously eliminate some of these um, lingering operational issues while learning at light speed, while offering up solutions and speaking to them in in their terms. Now, I had to learn very, very quickly. I started attending events. I started attending meetings. I started doing my own research. I, I, I had to make some um, strategic hires that, you know, uh, that were new, that had more business competency than perhaps the prior regime, and that truly understood what we were trying to accomplish, that were more resilient and adaptive leaders. Um, and over time, we, we earn the credibility. You know, I, I don't know that any new CIO, you have a honeymoon period, but there's no way we could have achieved this without, you know, kind of eliminating some pain points out of the gate. And, and you're never going to get everybody all at once, Michael. You're never, you're, it's never going to be a boardroom experience where everybody just nods their head and looks at you and goes, oh yeah, I guess he does know what he's talking about. You, you're you're going to partner one by one, two by two. So the first, you know, the first couple of partnerships that we established right out of the gate was with HR was with corporate communications, was with marketing. We have a terrific relationship with our marketing group. There is no light daylight between us, it's amazing. Um, so you know, this whole CMO, CIO thing just doesn't exist here um, because we speak daily and, and that's been terrific. Other groups were a little slower to come along. Well, it goes beyond just us liking together and liking each other and speaking, you know, singing kumbaya every day. It, it, it's we do genuinely like each other, but uh, uh, and we we have the kind of same mindset. But she's a she's a terrific partner, and we agreed early on that we were going to try to nip it in the bud and create shared goals. That meant sharing resources. That meant sharing um, our actual business and strategic goals for my organization and hers. Um, and, and that's all wonderful, but if I can't execute her strategy or our organization strategy from a marketing perspective, um, all that sunshine is going to go away pretty quickly. We have to, you know, we've had to continue to become a more nimble, more responsive, more reactive uh, IT organization because marketing tends to move much faster generally than IT does. And in order to keep up with that pace of change, and it's not without its pitfalls. I've screwed up and. I've given her permission, not that she needed it, but to, to call me out when she needed to call me out. And, and she has done the same thing. So it all starts with the human element. Me looking her in the eye and vice versa and saying, look, the only way we're going to be successful is doing this together and creating that mutual respect. And um, it trickled down to our teams. And I'm happy to say it's worked out very well. How do you manage the fact, as you said, that the marketing organization uh, has very short time frames, and IT has a different set of constraints that can affect the the time frames in which you can operate. So how do you how do you reconcile the different requirements of IT and the marketing organization together? Well, I, and I look at some of the technologies that they've wanted to roll out very very quickly, whether it's you know um, campaign management technologies, multi-channel you know marketing uh, strategies, uh, digital, mobile. Um, rebranding all of our web properties, it, it forced IT, well, first of all, let me go backwards. You know, any new CIO in his or her role has to find out who's on the bus pretty quickly. You know, who, who's on the bus? And people have heard me say, either you change people or you change people. And so I, we had to change our culture in IT to be a far more um, streamlined, simplified, standardized, responsive, forward-thinking organization. What, how do you do that? It's more than just a mindset. You reduce complexity in your IT organization. You shut down legacy. You streamline processes. You're invited early to the meetings. 
you say yes and you never say no. You say, well, let's talk about that. We have options. So there's a lot of very tactical things that go into being a better, a better partner. It forced us to come out of our comfort zone. It also forced us to, you know, to, to maybe give people sandboxes and let them play within it. You know, I, I, I say this all the time here. If I can get somebody, another department in a sandbox, we talk about shadow IT. If they can stay in the confines of that, meaning they're, they're not going to violate security, they're not going to put the organization at risk, let them play in the sandbox. Some of the best ideas that we're ever going to get are as if we provide them the tools and the kind of that, that environment to play in. Um, the flip side is we've had to educate about security, uh, about threats, digital threats that are out there, uh, and we meet in the middle. Um, I don't think we'll ever move as fast as they want us to. Uh, but I don't think we're as slow as, as uh, maybe that, you know, we're told from time to time. We have an interesting question from, uh, from Twitter. Arsalan okay. Khan asks, when you're talking about uh, first improving the operations and then yeah. transforming, would it help if the CIO and the COO, chief operating officer, were the same person? Is that a way to help address this issue? Wow, what a terrific question. Uh, selfishly, I would say yes. <laughs> it's a great question. Thank you for uh, tweeting that. Um, I, I will say this. In a perfect world, I, I think effective or really good CIOs make terrific COOs. And it would certainly eliminate a whole lot of handoffs if that CIO had operations as well. Um, I can tell you that as an organization, we've matured. We no longer have one, a COO. Uh, but we have the functions that normally would respond, you know, report up to a, a, a COO, uh, and they simply are owned by me and by other groups. So I think that's a vote of confidence, you know, by my boss, our CEO, that um, he respects our ability to deliver operational initiatives. So, but going back to the question in a perfect world, and that would be great. Would you know? Why not just be CEO at the time too? But. That job's taken right now. <laughs> one of the uh, so so one of the core things that any nonprofit has to do is manage donations. Is is find ways of getting donations and managing those do donations. And I know well. You were talking earlier about the importance of having a broad view of the customer and customer experience. Can you elaborate on that customer view? Talk about the customer view for us and how you interact with your customers and what do you do as far as that goes? Yeah, we're really spawned this for us is, you know, obviously there's the retail model that I referred to earlier. And we're primarily known for probably three or four different fundraising models around the, around the country, really around the world now in 25 countries. Relay for Life is by far our largest. So if you are in one of 5,000 communities around the world, you have probably seen a Relay for Life sign uh, near a school or near a track or near uh, you know, a park or something like that. That is our primary uh, fundraiser. Um, we have 5,000 of them, two and a half to three million participants in that every year. Uh, it's an amazing thing. I mean, 120,000 teams. Uh, and we take millions of transactions leading up to the actual events. The model's changing though. And it, it used to be back in the 80s, 90s, et cetera, that you build the event and people come and they clearly still do. Relayers are amazing. And this is one of many examples, but the, the paradigm is shifting now. You know, Michael, you know, the, the millennial uh, or even the Gen Xer or, you know, the Gen Zer wants to fundraise on his or her own terms. You may want to attend a relay once a year, and that's great. But you may want to have a bike-a-thon. So we're, we're pivoting and putting some of the fundraising power back into the hands of the individual versus making it an event-centric focus. So, well, what does that really mean? Well, it means I need to know Michael. It means I want to know Michael, the fundraiser. I want to know Michael, the, the patient, the survivor, the caregiver, the donor. I want to know all aspects of Michael so I can provide that tailored experience that rich, fulfilling experience that you walk away going, I just made a difference. I enjoyed my time with the American Cancer Society. I'm moving the needle in the battle against cancer. And the technology behind that comes in the form of a more robust CRM, uh, identity and access management, you know, from a constituent perspective, 
the linkages and the integrations between all of those. We call, you know, we're building something called the Customer or Constituent 360 Hub, which all applications will be able to feed from. So at any given time, let's, let's operationalize that. Michael makes a call to our 24-7, 365 call center to ask a question. I want to be able to see that you've also been a relay captain, that you're a survivor, that you've been on our website, so I, so I can thank you. I want the mailings that you get. I want the emails that you get for Michael, not for me. And we can do that to a certain extent with segmentation and all of those other things. That's table stakes. But I want it to be for Michael, not for a 40-something white male and so-and-so. I want it to be for Michael Krigsman. And, you know, we're getting there. Uh, and why? Because you walk away feeling like we're your American Cancer Society. And I'm not serving up data that's irrelevant or content that's irrelevant. We're making the best use of your donor dollars and your time. Because unlike the IRS, you don't have to pay us or give us anything. I mean, you, you, they're volunteers for a reason and they're donors. You have an option to go other, other places and you know, we've got to earn that investment in us. As you have undertaken these technology programs, it's, it's interesting, I, I say technology programs because there's technology that's obviously involved, but right. more importantly, these are business program changes that technology is enabling. That's right. So as, as you've undertaken, let's say, these business programs, what about the culture of the organization? How has that had, to, had how, how has that have to, have, had to have changed? Well, you know, it's funny. I, I was talking to somebody even earlier today about this very topic and, excuse me, I, I, uh, I laugh because you know, there were a time, there were times even in the first two, three years where occasionally you'd get that older employee that perhaps has been here 20, 25 years, uh, maybe has never been anywhere else and is not used to IT being a, a leader or a strategic enabler. And they would introduce you, they like, and this is Jay Farrow, our, our chief IT guy. And you just kind of stand there going, yeah, you know, and if you need any help with uh, Windows, uh, I'm happy to help or if you get a blue screen of death, let me know and I'll, I'll come over and reset it for you. I said, but you've just tapped out my desktop knowledge. I, it's been a while since I've been an IT guy. But all, all kidding aside, you know, some people under some executives and folks who have come from the outside primarily knew about the power of IT and I can't, had come from more progressive organizations. Our, our, our employee base skews very young. So millennials and, and Gen Xers have an expectation that technology is fairly far along. Some of the, um, and this is really not age, but you know, some of the folks who have maybe been here a long time weren't at first used to, uh, what's the IT guy think he knows about all of this strategy? Who's he talking about our programs? And, and again, you earn the credibility, not just through IT delivery, but through showing that you're a business leader, not just an IT leader. You've heard me say, Michael, that CIOs are business leaders first and technologists second, or at least good ones. But that means me showing up at events. That means me fundraising. I'm happy to say that of 100 plus thousand teams around the world for Relay, my IT team is in the top 20. Well, yeah, that I want the, the money that comes along with that for the organization. But almost as important is that all of my IT staff all around the country, we have to eat our own cooking. We have to use the mobile apps, the, the web apps, all the systems that we roll out. We show up at events and we talk to po folks who are using them and the learnings are, have just been terrific. But that's just one way I've earned credibility. Our team, more importantly, has earned credibility that we might know what we're talking about a little bit. So this is such an, an interesting topic and just to drill into, into this point for, for a moment, if you would. Sure. So you're the chief information officer, information technology technology role and yet at the same time the focus of what you do uh, is a set of business activities and again how does that be how do you reconcile that 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 technology technology job with the business role that's right so there are no we, we do have an IT strategy, but it's a subset of 
our business strategy. Let me, in fact, that's a very clumsy way to put it. Let me rephrase that. We have an IT operational improvement, continual improvement strategy. You know, we have all of these other things we talk about, whether it's social, mobile, analytics, cloud, all of these things where we want to reduce costs, improve efficiency, security. The big strategic projects that we're working on are not IT projects, yet every single one of them has IT as a leader in it. Right. So our strategy, my boss said it best. He said, Jay, and he said this on a, an enterprise wide call. There is nothing we've done. There is nothing we're doing and or nor there's anything that we will do that doesn't have IT as a strategic enabler or as a leader. And he's dead on. I don't care if it's research. I don't care if it's our new partnership with IBM Watson. I don't care if it's any of that. IT is at the table. Um, but I don't go in as the IT guy. I go in as a business person who understands what we're trying to accomplish. And then I ladle on how we can accomplish it. So, you know, too many CIOs or IT leads walk in with cloud this or cloud that or bits and bytes and blinking lights and racks and use and line speeds, all super important, all super important. They will yawn you out of the boardroom. Um, unless you can give them a real reason to care. And, uh, you know, the onus is on us as CIOs to understand and lead our business, not for the business to understand and lead IT. So how do you give them a reason to care? What do you do? You gotta prove it, you gotta execute. And, you know, you gotta show them at times that's required us to build proofs of concept that prove our understanding. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. Our mobile app, which we just, rolled out a new iteration of, we can take credit card, we can scan checks, people can check on their teams, you can use social login, our new fundraising app. It's terrific. We just did a soft launch, so next week is our big, kind of little sneak peek there, but it's, it, it's raised millions for us, even in the old iteration, which did, did half of what our new iteration is. The reason I bring this up is because our organization at first never asked me for this. They never said, Jay, we need a mobile app that does all of these things. They said, we need to do more with mobile. They said, well, boy, would it be great if we reduced our dependency on checks and, and use more than just a mobile web page that was very pretty, but something beyond that. But nobody said, Jay, we need a mobile app. We listened and heard all the business problems. I give my people permission to tinker, to use a percentage of their time at all times to, for quick wins, for tinkering, for innovation. And we, we created a proof of concept that, that scanned credit cards safely using PayPal's technology, but very transparent, partnered with Apple, partnered with a whole bunch of folks to help us design it, and brought it back to the head of marketing at the time. Uh, and they all kind of stared and said, I didn't know we could do that. And they said, you, you're solving business problems. You're, you're actually applying technology in a way that we hadn't even thought of. And that's just one of dozens of examples where we've led the, the, the conversation. Now, what they did is they said, but wouldn't it be great if it did this? Because once they saw that proof of concept and that straw man, we were able to iterate from that point on because they we got some credibility right out of the gate they realized that, hey, you guys might actually know our business processes. That, that's pretty solid for a first effort. So uh, I challenge you know, folks to listen, learn, and when you have an opportunity, don't wait to take the order. Don't wait for the, I need the fully fleshed business requirements. If you're listening, you know 80% of it. Go iterate, create a proof of concept, and uh, bring it back. If you miss, you miss. At least you've, you know, you, you, you've, you've tried. So the foundation is having real clar clarity and uh, very, very strong cooperation with the business because otherwise you wouldn't understand the nuances of what they actually need in order to build an, an app that meets their needs. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think too often IT professionals get enamored with the technology and we do it for technology's sake. Um, we built that not for our own edification or because mobile apps are cool, and they are, but uh, because we saw a business problem. We were taking too much paper. We were taking too many checks. At event, 
We couldn't process credit cards fast enough. We couldn't send out machines to read them fast enough. We didn't have a great peer-to-peer -peer technology where you and I are sitting at, a, at dinner and I say, well, you know, would you like to make a donation to my team? Yeah, I don't have my checkbook with me. Don't worry. I can take this right here securely, PCI compliant, all kinds of things. And, and that was something they just, they hadn't been exposed to it and they didn't know it could be done and we knew it and, and created a, a straw man. So part of that customer relationship then is using technology to allow people working at the American Cancer Society to, as salespeople say, always be closing. Always be closing. <laughs> always be closing. You know, the thing is, though, I mean, I love what we do. I love my, my IT organization. But what I'm most proud of, Michael, about any, everything we do is that it's never for the glory of IT. It's never for... Um, now, we love what we do, don't get me wrong, and we're very proud of the technology solutions, and we always want to get better. You know, we're our, we're, we are our own harshest critic. And if you're a CIO and you're not harder on your team than the business is, you're not going to be a CIO very long. That said, we love what our organization does. And so the passion for our mission, the passion for our, quote, product, the passion for our research, our fundraisers, God bless them, our volunteers, our field staff who just work their butts off, who are amazing, um, community managers, we want to make their lives easier and we're very passionate about that. We have. Yeah. Well, I mean, multiple reasons, right? Um, first and foremost, I think we dipped our toes in the way everybody does, payroll. <laughs> Time, the time and labor, maybe, <laughs> you know, with, with uh, ADP, they're like, oh, we're in the cloud. We, you know, we're a partner with uh, company X. Um, cloud is not a one size fits all. You know, it's a tool that, uh, that a CIO has in his or her tool belt. And we looked at it and I said, if somebody can do something better, faster, cheaper, or more securely and offer me more capability for the same or less, or even more, if it's significantly more capability, I want to have a discussion. I want to get rid of the commodity technologies. So you look, the, the, the first big foray was getting off of Lotus Notes and moving to Microsoft 365. And that was, uh, that was huge for us. I mean, Notes had been here since 1998. We had 5,000 applications in Lotus Notes. And so moving to SharePoint, moving to the cloud, moving to all of that was a huge cultural change more than it was a technology change. And, but it proved, and it was very, very successful but it enabled so many other things. It enabled cloud-based storage. It enabled cloud-based collaboration with our volunteers. It enabled all of these other things, uh, VoIP or UCAS uh, solutions for some of our smaller offices we're beginning to roll out using some of the more advanced stuff that Microsoft's rolling out now. Why? Better capabilities, more security, faster iterations than I can do. For me to replicate what they're doing, and again, it's not limited to Microsoft. There are dozens of terrific cloud providers out there uh, that, we're, that we're looking at or have used. For me to replicate that would be cost prohibitive and nor would I want to invest donor dollars. So I want to be able to look our constituents in the eye and say, I am squeezing out the most I can for the dollars that we've been given. Um, other things we're looking at are future state CRM. Right now our CRM is on-prem. It's a legacy CRM. It's huge install. It's the heart of a lot of what we do, 75, almost 77 million constituent records, um, huge by any measure. Uh, whatever we select here later this year, it will not be here. I want it to be in the cloud. Uh, I want it to be mobile first. And I wanted to enable our workforce out in the field because they're the people doing the real work, them and our volunteers, not, not me or not us. Our job is to make their lives easier and not have them VPN in and you know, stand on one foot and dance in a circle in order to get what they need. I want it on, on their terms in a platform agnostic, mobily enabled, secure way. Is there any part of your systems technology data that you plan to keep on premise because you don't want the cloud? And if so, what would that be? Yeah, some of our research data right now. I mean, longer term, we may, we may look at those. Um, we have a lot of research studies and epidemiology, epidemiology data that Probably we will, you know, not look at right away. Um, you know, we're slowly moving DR. Uh, we we 
when I joined, we had a couple hundred data centers and I'll, I'll, I'll qualify data center as a closet in Michael's office um, that had a rack and you know a local active directory replica, a local router, a local file and print server. I'm happy to say we've pulled out 90% of that and we're now at a point where um, you know, I can hand off DR and I can hand off these commodity technologies to a cloud provider, but there's a handful of things, particularly around the research arena and some of our um, cancer control information and other things that short midterm will probably keep on prem. Um, but I can't imagine a scenario where longer term we wouldn't consider the cloud for, uh, for just about everything that we do. You mentioned earlier that changing over to the cloud required a culture shift, which again, it's one of those things that I find so interesting because on one level, the cloud is a change in technology. It's not a change in mind, but actually it is a change in mind. So maybe elaborate on that point. Yeah, you know, um, it, it, the cloud, I think, you know, three years ago when we did, you know, when we first kind of dove in head first was a, a little bit of a scary thing for some of the older school folks, uh, IT and non. We took great comfort in the warmth of our blinking lights and the fact that I could go in and touch the silicone and uh, on all of that. And uh, I, I think just getting folks comfortable that um, first and foremost, our data is secure. Uh, that we are truly going to capture the efficiencies that we're going to capture. So we put together a business case. I said, look, let me put my money where my mouth is. And let's measure ROI. Let's measure the benefits that we're getting. And I'm happy to say that uh, they all bore out. And it was really more fear of change than it was actual fear of, of, of reality. And, um, you know, one of the things that's helped us, Michael, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up, is we've established champions all across the country. So I'm talking about non-IT folks who are more tech savvy, that want to be early adopters of technology, that want to be change agents. You hear me and my good friend David Bray and so many other people talk about being change agents. And I'm proud to say that we have a number of change champions and change agents around this organization that are terrific that are early adopters that want to become evangelists. So whenever we roll out a new technology, whether it's our mobile apps or 365 or new um, business and analytical capability, um, new mobile CRM capability, we establish these groups of eight change agents around the, around the organization to beat it up, provide feedback. They're allowed to be brutally honest with us about what works, but guess what? They feel like they're in, in the fold, and they are. They're invaluable. And when we do roll it out, you have built-in evangelists that are at your defense you know, where, whenever, uh, whenever you roll out a big technology. So it's worked really well on multiple fronts. Jay, you mentioned David Bray. And for folks who don't know, David Bray yeah. is the chief information officer for the Federal Communications Commission. And he's he is. Yeah, I, sh I should have said that. David. Uh, a terrific change agent and a terrific CIO and a, and a good friend. So historically, change we thought about change management as very often you're rolling out an ERP system and Central HQ is sending out newsletters saying everything's <laughs> going to be great. <laughs> oh, you've been here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what is change management in today's world? Well, it's about transparency and inclusiveness, quite frankly. I, you know, I, I heard a, a change manager uh, once tell me that you can't communicate too much, which I think is a bit of an overstatement. But um, to me, it's all about setting the right expectations about what is and what isn't going to happen, um, being as inclusive and as transparent as you can. Um, describing and being very and articulating the desired outcomes and the reasons that you're changing and being as you know being as open and honest about those as you can and god knows when you screw up admit you screwed up um you know when we decided to move to office 365 uh one of the things we also did was implemented email retention well you know as well as i do that when a cio tries to lead email retention it doesn't go very well. So I enlisted our chief, uh, our excuse me, our general counsel and our COO at the time 
And I said, if I'm going down, I'm taking you two with me. And, but it was a huge change. People were using email as a file retention system, and that was just not a good place to be. And uh, this is just one kind of small tactical example, but we had to be very open and honest about why we needed to change. I know it's tough. We're giving you these alternatives. Um, come along with us for the ride. Trust us, it's gonna be okay. We're giving you these different ways of collaboration through team sites or through our new intranet or through all these other things like Yammer and other technologies that we use. I promise, just trust us, take the leap, it'll be worth it. Um, I'd say 95% of the people were okay with that. And when we did screw up, it wasn't some cryptic message from information technology. It was an email from Jay Farrow saying, oops, you know, when it was a big enough error, I said, look, I expect better. We should have done better. And uh, you won't see this happen again on my watch. We're going to do everything we can to prevent it. Um, and that earns credibility along the way, too. So if traditional, ch God, I don't want to insult my friends who are in change management. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, so if, if I'll say it anyways, if traditional change management is about whitewashing yeah. and getting the corporate line out there, distributing the corporate message, uh. then modern change management is blank. And you, I'll ask you to fill in that blank. Transparency. Transparency. Okay. And so is, tr is change management today then uh, also to some extent an influencer relations function, as you were describing, essentially. It's oh, absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. You know, the, 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 the reason so many change management initiatives fail is because they're incomplete. We think that sending out a bunch of, to your point, whitewash memos to the organization, well, we told you, you didn't read the memo. We're putting cover sheets on the TPS reports these days. Maybe, you know, uh, did you not get that? And, you know, that's not change management. That's an email. And that's a memo. And so we put in a multi-pronged communication and change management strategy within IT when I first came, where it's, these are all our different communication vehicles. These are our different constituents. This is how we communicate to them. This is when, you know, so we have this whole communication strategy, which actually um, Gartner did a, did a, a case study on, but uh, we were very proud of it. it, it it's we wanted to open the kimono as much as you can. Now, here's what I'm not saying. There is proprietary data and or proprietary things you can't discuss. I, I recognize that. So you always get that one contrarian that's gonna be like, oh, well, you can't talk about salary. Yeah, I know you can't talk about salary information and personal data and all that. But where you can be open and transparent, you need to be. This is what we're expecting. It's gonna be hard. I apologize in advance. We're gonna be living in a dual system world for about three months. I know it stinks, but thank you for your patience. Thank you. When we get here, we're gonna save the organization millions. When we get here, you're gonna be able to do this. Come along for the ride with me. Um, and it required me and my leadership to be extremely visible, recording videos, um, walking around, visiting sites, thanking people. Um, you know, it, it's part of being a servant leader. We're almost out of time, but since, but since you brought up the concept of servant leadership, maybe you can elaborate on that very, but briefly though, because we're, we're really just about out of time. Yeah, you know, to me, if you're not ready to serve, you're not ready to lead. And, and you know, it's all about um, enabling your team, providing strategic direction, thanking them, um, in, you know, getting out of their way, knocking down barriers, uh, disciplining when necessary, but with a servant's heart and mind and uh, recognizing that the best way to leave is to serve. And people think it maybe it's a position of weakness uh, and it's the, the complete opposite. The, 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 the big misconception is that there's a finite amount of glory or recognition, a finite bucket. And the reality is that the more that you give away, the bigger the bucket becomes. And uh, um, you know, that's, my dad taught me that years ago. I don't know that I appreciated it, Michael, when I was a young man, but the older I get, the more I realize that guy was right about a lot of things. So. We had a guest, uh, Sanjay Poonin, who is a, oh. do you know Sanjay? I do, yeah. And he spoke at length about servant leadership. But we are just about out of time, but let's finish. What advice do you have for both CIOs and their organizations to get the maximum value, the maximum benefit from IT? Start with 
the, the problems you're trying to solve. Start with the customer in mind. Start with the product you're trying to deliver. Start with the service that you're trying to provide. Don't start with the solution in mind. Okay. Educate, educate yourselves, reach across the aisle, um, relocate, knock down the barriers. Um, at the end of the day, I, I see, Michael, the biggest problems, the biggest challenges to any organization is people just don't communicate. They don't get in a room and everybody's worried about turf. They're worried about credit. They're worried about headcount. They're worried about all this other stuff. Worry about outcomes. What are you trying to accomplish as an organization? There is plenty of glory to go around. There's plenty of work to be done. Um, and, and just roll up your sleeves, check your ego at the door, focus on the outcomes, focus on transforming and delighting your customers. Uh, and good things really begin to happen. The technology, I promise, will fall into place. For CIOs, never take your eye off the operational ball while you're doing all this. Nobody cares that you want to set sail to Bora Bora while your boat's taking on water. Um, you'll be underwater pretty quick and you won't get out of the harbor. So uh, we get to do both. Okay, wow. Lots of wisdom on how to be a good CIO and how, to, for an, how an organization can take advantage of technology in the business context. You have been watching episode number 167 of CXO Talk, and we've been speaking with Jay Farrow, who is the Chief Information Officer of the American Cancer Society. Jay, again, thank you so much for being with us today. Michael, thank you. It's been terrific being here, and congratulations on 167. That's quite an accomplishment. You know, just relentlessly doing it. Everybody, thank you for watching. Again, thanks to Jay Farrow, and come back next time. Bye-bye, everybody.